In this video, we review what you need to know about IP addresses and Azure Virtual Networks. Hello everyone, I'm Travis and welcome to my channel. IP addresses have been around since the beginning of the internet. However, if you're new to cloud services like Azure or just new to IT infrastructure in general, configuring network settings and IP addresses can be confusing. This video gives those starting out some hopefully helpful information that will reduce confusion and maybe even limit some headaches down the road. Before we get started, please like, subscribe, and share with a friend. Check out my courses on Azure Virtual Desktop, Hybrid Identities with Windows AD and Enter ID, and Windows 365 on udemy.com. The links are below. And thank you, channel members. Your support is appreciated. Let's get into it. I got an interesting question recently asking why new Azure VNets default to the same address space and subnet. If you leave them set as default, each VNet in the environment will have the same or overlapping IP addresses, and that will prevent VNet peering. VNet peering links multiple VNets so devices attached to them can communicate with each other. This linking is not possible with IP address overlap. In addition, if you plan to connect Azure VNets to an on-premises network, having overlapping IP addresses will cause a lot of problems. Getting IP addresses right from the start can save a lot of headaches down the road. It can be difficult and disruptive to change IPs after services have been deployed. A little understanding and planning up front can go a long way when it comes to networking. So why is overlapping IP addresses an issue and what can we do about it? To get to those answers, we need to dig into IP addresses and subnetting. And to set expectations, this video is on IP version 4. Also, IP addresses and networking are big topics with a lot of nuances and details that are not possible to cover in just this one video. I try to cover the basics with information that will be useful for those starting out. If you know what an ARP table is and how to calculate subnets manually, this video may be somewhat basic. Let's start with what an IP address is. It's a group of four 8-bit numbers separated by dots. Each group is called an octet. Those 8-bit octets will become important later. We can have public or private IP addresses. A public IP is routable on the internet. Each device on the internet has to have a public IP. Even the computer you're using is accessing the internet with a public IP address. You can find that by opening a browser tab and going to whatsmyip.com or my favorite, ipchicken.com. But that's probably not the IP address assigned to your computer. Your computer has a private IP address. A private IP address is not routable on the internet. Let's pause here and go over a quick history lesson. Back when there were a small number of universities, government agencies, and businesses using the internet, every computer could have its own public IP address. But IP version 4 or v4 has a limited number of IP addresses available. The number is over 4 billion, but not all are usable. There's not enough for all the computers, phones, tablets, cars, smart refrigerators, Wi-Fi enabled pet feeders, and other devices across the globe to connect to the internet with a public IP address today. Instead of giving every device a public IP address, some blocks of IP addresses were designated as private IPv4 addresses. These private IP addresses cannot be used on the internet. Any private IP address that attempts to access the internet will be dropped at the first networking device it hits. These private IP addresses are available for any organization or person to use in their private networks. That's what's used on computers connected to our corporate network, in Azure, or at home. A block of IPs is a continuous block of IP addresses. There are three blocks of private IP addresses we can use. The first is a class A IP block, that starts with 10.0.0.0 and includes everything in the 10 dot network. Large organizations frequently use this range because it can be subnetted into many smaller networks. We'll talk about subnetting shortly. Next is the class B private network that starts with 172.16.0.0 and goes to 172.31.255.255. If you're using the 172.16 private network, Keep in mind that this network only goes to 172.31.255.255. An IP address that starts with 172.32 is a valid public IP address. Anything outside of the 172.16 to 172.31 range 
should not be used for private IP addresses. And last is the Class C 192.168.0.0 private network. That includes everything in the 192.168 network. The 192.168 address range is common for consumer routers like home devices. They often use that 192.168 address as the default. You may be wondering how your laptop and smart TV can access the internet if it has a private IP address. And why does IP Chicken show a public IP if your computer has a private IP? That's where network address translation or NAT comes in. NAT is a way of masking or translating many like hundreds or even thousands of private IP addresses behind a small number of public IP addresses. This limits public IP address exhaustion and provides security by controlling client access to the internet. In Azure, we can leverage NAT on multiple resources such as a NAT gateway, Azure firewall, a network virtual appliance, or a load balancer. Now let's get into some networking details. If we look at the default configuration supplied with a new VNet, it shows the address space is 10.0.0.0 slash 16. And the default subnet is 10.0.0.0 slash 24. The slash and the number at the end refers to the subnet or the subnet mask. We'll dig into that shortly. And please stick with me on this. This is all basic IPv4 networking that will make planning and managing networks easier. What makes up an IP address? As we already stated, an IP address is made up of four 8-bit numbers for a total of 32 bits. Each group of 8 bits is called an octet. Let's narrow this down to one octet of 8 bits. That gives us eight positions. Each position has a value. It starts with one on the right, and each position doubles in value as we move to the left. Keep in mind that computers only work with ones and zeros. We're translating binary to decimal because that's easier for humans to read. At the top, each bit, a zero means off and one means on. All off means the octet equals the decimal value of zero. All on would mean we add the value of each position for a total of 255. 255 has a special meaning we'll review shortly. Let's look at the class A 10.0.0.0 slash 8 private IP range next. To get the value of 10 at the first octet, we need to identify what bits need to be enabled that add up to 10. In this case, if we enable the 2 and the 8 position and add them together, we get 10. The screen shows the binary equivalent of 10. The last three octets for this IP are all zero. This is how all IP addresses work. Another example, let's say 172.16.0.0 would look like this. For the first octet, we need to enable the value positions for 128, 32, 8, and 4. The total comes to 172. For the second octet, we just have to enable the 16th place to get 16. There are two parts in an IP address, the network address and the host address. The network address is unique to all connected networks. It identifies in the network and is used to route traffic between different connected networks. The network number is also frequently called a subnet. A subnet defines what part of the IP address is the network number. Then we have the host. This is unique within the network. It's the portion of the IP address assigned to the client. There is flexibility in what we use for a network and what we use for the host. That brings us to the slash 8 at the end of our class A IP address. The slash and the number after it, 8 in this case, identifies what part of the IP address is the network part. The rest of the IP addresses are allocated for host addresses. The number after the slash is often referred to as the subnet. The first part of the IP address is always used to identify the network, and we can change how much of the address is used for the network and how much is used for the client IDs. For this example, the first eight bits, or slash eight, is the network. The subnet mask in binary terms would consist of all eight bits equaling one, the decimal equivalent of 255. Sometimes the subnet mask uses the four octet dot notation that would equal 255.0.0.0. If you had to assign IP addresses to devices, that may look familiar. In the example of subnet 10.0.0.0 slash eight, the first octet, 10, is the network address the last three octets are host addresses. There's a problem with this example, however. There are a total of two to the power of 24 host addresses. This subnet will support one network, the 10 network, and over 16 million clients. 
Odds are your private network needs more than one subnet and probably has less than 16 million clients. Let's go back to the create a virtual network settings in Azure. Here we have the address space of 10.0.0.0 slash 16 and the subnet of 10.0.0.0 slash 24. Address spaces on a VNet define all the IP addresses that will be in all subnets on the VNet. In this case, the private 10 network is subnetted, meaning we took some of the client IDs and used them for the network ID. The slash 16 indicates the first two octets are now used for the network. The network ID in this case is 10.0, and the remaining are used for client IDs. In Azure, we have to define all the IPs that will exist in the VNet. The address space is a summary that tells Azure where to route traffic when the subnets are paired. If we look at the default subnet, it's further subnetted to a slash 24. That means that the first 24 bits or the first three octets are used for the network ID and the last is used for the client ID. Let's dig a little deeper. With this configuration, we can only use IP addresses that start with 10.0. That's defined in the address space. Let's try to add a subnet that starts with 10.1. It won't let us because the subnet is not in the 10.0.0.0 slash 16 range, but 10.0.1.0 is. The automatically created 10.0.0.0 subnet is in the address space. The slash 24 indicates the first three octets are the network ID, and the last octet is for clients. So if we have the address space of slash 16, and we create subnets on the third octet, that gives us 254 possible subnets that we can have in the VNet. The first value, zero, is reserved for the network ID. The last, 255, is used for a broadcast address. And we have a total of 254 IP addresses in each subnet. The value goes from zero to 255. Zero is again reserved for the network ID, and 255 is reserved for the broadcast address. Let's look at all the reserved IP addresses next. The first IP address is reserved to identify the whole current network. This is usually the .0 address in the subnet. The last IP address is reserved for a broadcast IP. In this example, that's the .255 address. Also, Azure reserves the first three available IP addresses. So for our 10.0.0.0 slash 24 example, 10.0.0.0 is the network ID. 10.0.0.1 is used by Azure for the default gateway. Clients use this to communicate with computers outside the subnet. 10.0.0.2 and 10.0.0.3 are used for Azure DNS services. And 10.0.0.255 is the broadcast address. This is used to communicate with all computers attached to the subnet. So why can't clients communicate with each other if we use the same subnet in different VNets? It feels like it took a while to get here. I hope all this information was worth it. Let's look at how clients communicate inside a subnet. Say client with the IP address 10.0.0.10 slash 24 needs to communicate with client 10.0.0.20 slash 24 on the same subnet. The client sees the computer is on the same 10.0.0 subnet. It uses the broadcast address to reach out to all the clients and find the one with the IP it's looking for. Once found, they initiate communication. Now let's do the same, only this time the clients are on different VNets with the same subnet. Client 10.0.0.10 broadcasts out to the local subnet looking for 10.0.0.20, and there's no response and the connection fails. Or maybe there is a 10.0.0.20 on the network, but it's another client. The 10.0.0.20 the client is looking for is a web server. The connection fails because it's trying to open a web port on the wrong computer. Let's switch to the second VNet so now it has the 10.1.0.0 slash 24 subnet and the client IP is 10.1.0.20. The client will see that the IP address it's looking for is not on the local subnet so it will pass it to the default gateway. From there the connection is routed to the correct client over VNet peering. The client will pass the response back to the gateway where it's routed back to the client. This can only work if all connected VNets use different address spaces and subnets in that space. That's why it's important not to rely on the default. And consider the entire network. If an on-premises site is connected and had overlapping IP addresses, we would have the same issue.
What can you do to prevent overlapping IPs and plan for growth? The first step is to know what subnets are in use in your organization. Many of you are in environments with a network that's already in place and don't have the luxury of deploying brand new networks. There may be an IP database or management tool in place. This will help a lot in tracking and planning IP addresses. For small and medium companies that don't have an IP management tool, a spreadsheet is a viable option, at least to start. Inventory what subnets are in use and the location they're used at. If there are branch offices or other clouds in the mix, document them as well. This will help you avoid overlapping subnets. Next, plan for growth. It may seem like there's a lot of available IP addresses, especially with the 10.0.0.0 network, but that can get used surprisingly fast when they're subnetted into smaller networks. Inventorying existing subnets and planning for growth is important so we don't use overlapping IP addresses. This goes a long way when connecting networks in Azure or on-premises. And don't settle for the defaults when deploying Azure. Just like we don't use the default size and OS when deploying VMs, we need to understand the requirements for networking and plan accordingly. I hope this helps you better understand how to plan and configure networking in Azure. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and thanks for watching.